Welcome to this next edition of Cyber Tangent. I am Landon Johnson, your cybersecurity professional from Nehemiah Security. We are here to talk about cyber as a driver for business decisions. We're joined by Richard Van Horn today. Hi, Richard. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Good to have you. Richard has been in the world of IT governance, risk, and control for over 20 years. His career has evolved along with the field from working as an IT auditor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to implementing enterprise security solutions at Fidelity Investments, to managing IT risk at Goldman Sachs, CIT Group, DTCC, and J.P. Morgan Chase. Richard was certified as a CISA, Certified Information Systems Auditor, and is currently certified as a CRISC, Certified Risk and Information Systems Control, from ISACA. Richard resides in New Jersey with his family, including three children, and more can be found at technologyatrisk.info. So, Richard, to dive right into it, why should we care what impact cyber has on a business? Sure. I think it's pretty obvious that most businesses rely on technology to do their business services and their business functions. And so without technology, most businesses would be just not making money and not performing their functions. So security is in, technology security and cybersecurity are critical functions to keep the business functioning, keep the business running. And so... The business has to be aware of their cybersecurity issues and problems so they can manage that risk like they manage other risks for their business. And I do make the distinction between cybersecurity and technology risk. There is a bit of a difference. So I consider cybersecurity to be batting the hatches down and locking the doors where you might be attacked by competitors. You might have employees who might be not the best employees. They might have, there might be ex-employees who might want to do some damage to your firm. So cybersecurity, in my view, is defending against those attacks and those kinds of attacks. Technology risk is more of a risk function where you look at technology as a service to manage based on ROI. So like other risk functions, at least in the financial services world, you might have market risk and credit risk functions where you look at the, the function credit, credit management and the risk of a potential default from a client or a counterparty, that's credit risk management. And you make business decisions based on on that methodology. Technology risk management is the same in the sense you have an ROI to manage against. You have technology concerns. It could be, for example, uh, end of life. Your assets might be approaching end of life, no longer supported by their vendor. And you need to manage that risk of the end of life asset out of the firm those are more risk-based decisions than cybersecurity. So both of those, in my view, are critical for any company to manage to be productive and a profitable organization. Okay. And I know that you have a, a really broad perspective on this because of your work with your, within your working groups and your involvement with a number of chief risk and chief security officers. Where would you say we are in this sensitivity? Let me ask this. How many, how many C-level executives think cyber is just an IT problem still? I think that's becoming fewer and fewer. Well, you said IT executives or business executives? I think you, just... you, can, you can take them both if you want. <laughs> okay. Well, I think uh, I do know that in the banking world, the SEC is obligating public companies and their boards to be more aware of their cybersecurity and technology risk. And so that's a, a guidance, as they say, from the regulators, which is more like a mandate where auditors and boards of directors and audit committees have to pay more attention to their technology risk and cybersecurity posture, whatever that means. And so the challenge that the industry is having is, how do you convey technology risk and cybersecurity to a non-technical audience? And so if a business CEO has to be aware of this, these challenges, he doesn't talk bits and bytes like the technical staff do. How do you translate these issues so that your business sponsors, who are now responsible for being aware at least, hopefully being more than aware and actually managing, but how do you translate some of these things to the executives? So I think there's a general awareness of this space on the business side more and more, not only by mandate, but because it's how their business runs. And when you have, last year there was an example with Amazon going dark for a few hours, it's everywhere where you have outages, you have data breaches. The businesses have to be aware in general and they have to learn how to manage it. And so it's it's not really an option any longer in my opinion. Okay. I know we are kindred spirits in our desire to measure this risk that we're talking about, the technology risk and the cyber risk. 
In, in your work with business leaders and with technology leaders, what do you see as the most common obstacles to measuring risk? Most common obstacles is, at least in our, in our experience, and I will add, so I have a, a working group that's trying to address some of these questions. And one of the questions we're, just, we're trying to address now is the obstacle of how do you measure the value of your technology assets based on the business services they support? And so a risk, in our view, is usually dollars and cents with a probability and those kind of factors. So how do you measure your technology risk in dollars and cents? And that currently is an obstacle because there's no clean or clear way to do that. If I have two servers, how is one more important than the other? How is that determined besides their dollar asset value? How do you determine if server A is more important than server B? And we're actually trying to figure that out in the sense that that value should be derived based on the business service each one supports. And the example we give is payroll and treasury, where both are important functions. They both manage large dollars. Right. Payroll is usually a, an order of magnitude you know, less money than treasury. Our view is that the best way to measure business risk is based on the, the services you support. And that by itself is a challenge because there's no way of doing that. And it's just hard to, to calculate that. So that, that obstacle, that is a big obstacle to assess for business, business executives to assess their technology risk and technology impact. Yeah, that does seem like a shift kind of across the board from the historical way of thinking, both from a people standpoint, a process standpoint, and a technology standpoint. If you're suggesting focusing on the business application of the business process as opposed to the IT asset, it seems like a shift. That's exactly right. And it's been a, it's a long discussion because when you say the word technology risk, you might get many different answers what that is, what the definition is. We try to clarify that definition, which is different than IT compliance. It's different than IT audit. So IT audit, in our view, is a very clear function where you have a department that reports to the board and provides insights on controls that are expected to be in place and does testing. That's a very clear function. IT compliance is a whole, another clear function that looks at making sure your firm complies with regulatory obligations and those requirements. And IT risk is a whole different definition. Again, we define IT risk as the business impact of technology outages and technology issues above and beyond compliance. So compliance is a baseline in our view, which regulators set for many firms and many organizations and many industries. But that baseline is just a baseline. And as we've seen, Many data breaches at many firms, are those firms are compliant with PCI and other regulations. It didn't stop their data breaches. And so we see risk, technology risk, as being above and beyond compliance. And that technology risk is based on business value. So if you're complying with all your regulations, that's fantastic. But to go the extra mile on, on protecting yourself, you want to protect your most important assets. And that in our view, has to be determined based on the business services those technology assets support. It sounds complex. So if you don't, <laughs> yeah. if you don't mind, Richard, I'm going to ask you to help paint the picture a little bit for us of what it looks like for an organization to calculate the potential impact or calculate this risk, this technology risk, this IT risk, this cyber risk. If you can help paint the picture of what the process is that they can go through, what tools are required to accomplish it, and maybe even a little bit about who within the organization ought to be involved with an initiative like this. I think that'd be helpful. Sure. So the easy part is who should be involved. And again, in our view, this is a joint technology and business effort. And so in my prior experience, the technology risk group would work with the operational risk group. This is becoming, an, technology risk is becoming an operational risk kind of function or subdivision. And those two groups usually work together, should work together to help perform this process. Now, the process is not well defined. It's still kind of in flux based on our experience where determining your critical business functions is an ongoing analysis. You might have 25 business services that you want to manage. You might have employee services like payroll. You might have corporate functions like treasury, and they're all important. Determining how important they are and their value to the firm is a debate sometimes. There's no methodology as of yet to help you do that. And so that is one of the challenges that the industry faces is how do you even start to determine business impact? We're starting to do that ourselves in our, in our working group to help firms do this, because it is a complex task and it's not well-defined. 
But that's where we would start is have operational risk and technology risk, agree this is the approach to take, and find some way, hopefully with some help from experts like ourselves, but find some way to quantify these services. So treasury is a pretty well-known service. If you have a billion dollars in the bank, that is a starting point for valuing that service as an asset. Payroll is a pretty well-defined service with employee records and dollars attached to those. That's another way to figure out the dollar value of that service in terms of potential losses and potential costs involved. So still a very nebulous process, but that's where we would start in terms of getting the right people involved to figure out how these assets or what these assets are valued at. How about the tools? What's the toolkit for accomplishing something like this? So this is interesting. And so we've seen more and more tools in the space that are extending the kind of older or historical GRC platforms, many governance risk and compliance platforms in the technology space are focused on compliance. And so many products out there in the GRC space will strictly look at compliance as the main area of focus. So most firms, many firms, obviously banks, which is a part of my background, are regulated, highly regulated across jurisdictions. And those GRC platforms help you ensure and attest that you are compliant with those regulations. But that, as I said earlier, is only a baseline. And new platforms, new GRC tools, including Nehemiah and other firms that are out there, are taking the risk view, as we discussed, to the next level. So they're taking the GRC risk level view, I should say, from a compliance perspective to a risk perspective. And we're seeing these tools do exactly as we just described. They're looking at different ways to assess risk, either based on dollars, based on threats, based on various ways to enhance the platforms to be more than compliance driven, but to give insight into the risks of the environment to go beyond and to do more around controlling those risks and mitigating those risks. So new platforms are coming up across the industry and those platforms like Nehemiah are providing new insights into managing risk beyond compliance. So I'm going to ask you selfishly to help set me up for success, Richard. (laughs) Next week, along with a few of my team members, we are going out to Las Vegas to attend a three-day SAP GRC conference. Okay, there's going to be 1,500 professionals who are steeped in GRC, specific to SAP. What are we likely to run into as far as a reaction from these GRC professionals when we start talking about measuring cyber risk and putting dollar values to these potential loss scenarios? Well, the responses I've heard from my, many of my peers is it can't be done. Space is too complex. There's too many moving parts and moving variables to accurately predict either probability and or impact. It's at this point to me, I think people are looking for a solution. Many people think it's impossible to address. And I think that's the mix of people I've seen. Our approach is to use examples like we've done on this podcast where Treasury and payroll are easily distinguished as different valuable assets. How you do that precisely is still open to fine-tuning, but it's clear that you can have different value on assets, just no matter how you do it. And other factors like probability, threat vectors, those things are also part of the model that has to be investigated. So we don't think it's impossible. We think it's hard, actually very hard, and we're looking to solve those problems, at at least start. And I think people want a new solution they just don't, haven't given enough thought themselves or know that people are trying to solve it to realize that it's already underway. So what's my response when I am asked, what role does GRC play in measuring risk? So that's an easy answer, in my opinion. Okay. So GRC is governance, risk, and compliance. Most GRC tools, as I said, are compliance-driven, and which is great. And that's very important. You need to comply with your regulations, all those important components. But as we've also seen, compliance is not enough. If you ask the former CEO of Target, they were PCI compliant before they were breached, yet they were still breached. And so compliance is just a baseline. And given that example that that breach impacted the business, the CEO and others, the CISO wasn't just fired from that, I don't believe, and Equifax as well. These issues, these technology issues are going across technology into the business areas. And for CEOs to keep their jobs in effect, they need to manage to their risk beyond compliance. Platforms like Nehemiah and other platforms that are emerging in the space are helping business owners, including CEOs, not only keep their jobs, 
but keep their business running and managing their technology risk much better than in the past. Great. Thank you for helping me be successful next week. I hope, I, I hope that helps. <laughs> that, that, that actually does help. It does help. I, I anticipate that very question. So if we think a little bit down the road to a time when organizations have a risk quantification engine up and running, you've thought a lot about this, Richard. What is, what's that scorecard likely to contain? What impact factors, scorecard items are likely to be the common ones that bubble up to the top as far as what companies should measure? Sure. And so my answer to that is the technology risk is not like other risk functions. So my peers in financial risk have these models that look at currency fluctuations and those various ways to look at financial risk. And that is sometimes real time. You look at traders who trade equities and stocks and bonds. They look at trends in a very real time environment. And that is not what I see happening with technology risk. I see technology risk being a bit more longer term because it's hard to change infrastructure and it's hard to change controls. But what I do see happening is you'll have inputs into that model where you have, again, your business services. And those services may change over time. So you may have a new product offering that comes out that becomes you know, the next iPad or iPhone with high dollar revenue, high dollar profits from nowhere. And that has become a new business driver in your environment. And you want to apply the right controls to that high risk service and controls for, let's say, legacy services that might have declined over time. You might be spending too much money on those controls for less valuable services. What I see happening is a longer term view of where your technology spend is for security, where you can manage your spend again, based on the business services you offer and their importance to your firm over time. And you can reallocate controls over time as you do this analysis and modeling. So that's what I see happening over time is that it's not going to be a day-to-day change this switch. It's going to be, you know, this business service has grown tremendously over the past two or three years, but our, it has some control opportunities to make sure it continues versus this service has declined in value. We don't need to spend all that money to protect that business service we can reallocate. And that's what I see happening over time. But I I would add one thing, though. In my experience, security is getting more expensive. And the business not only cares about their business, you know, the business CEOs not only care about their business as a robust provider of services, they're also focused on ROI of their spend. And so these, these decisions that are being made and these things we're talking about in terms of managing risk is an ROI discussion as well. Am I spending the right amount of money to protect myself or am I spending too much or too little is it allocated appropriately? These tools help in that decision making. Yes, I, I think you're alluding to what I've seen out in the market too. Is this spend on cyber now has has long ago exceeded the level at which companies are not going to start demanding an ROI type of conversation around it. That kind of gets to the spirit of our title here: cyber as a driver for business decisions. I think that's exactly right. My experience is in banking, and banking have, have bankers have regulations, obviously, and sometimes. Banks will throw money at a problem. Other firms that aren't as regulated, mid-market firms, don't have that luxury and need better tools to manage their spend and their ROI on security. That's great. So when there is the debate, when people lead off with it's too hard, it can't be done, do you find there's a recurring core of what they're referring to as far as the part that can't be done? Is there a, is there a spirit behind there or an obstacle behind there that, that people are stuck on that's preventing them from moving forward? What I've seen is that you have technologists who are very good at their jobs, but don't see or don't have the experience in managing risk. And then and risk is a whole different expertise. And you have experts in risk, mostly financial risk and operational risk, who don't know technology. And so I'm finding that those skill sets are within their industries and don't always cross over, where you have technologists who can talk risk and you have risk people who can talk technology. That, to me, has been a problem. And again, we're trying to find people who can bridge that gap for our working group where we can refine the approach to managing technology risk. And what I mean by that is financial risk modeling is a well-known function, and we're trying to apply financial risk modeling to technology risk as best we can. And it's not a perfect match. What I mean by that is in financial risk modeling, the three or four factors involved in risk are business impact over a time horizon with probability. And so how much money will I lose in the next year if this event 
happens and what's the probability of that event actually happening. And that's what financial modelists do or modelers do. And that's not a perfect match. So we're trying to refine that approach to technology risk. And we're actually debating, can you have probability when discussing technology risk? And there's pros and cons to both sides. But generally speaking, we don't think you can. So we're trying to refine how you apply proper risk modeling techniques to technology risk as a way to overcome some of these obstacles and making it simpler, trying to make it simpler for all of us to to manage and process. Start simple anyways, right? <laughs> so w- one more question about the calculation component. We've talked about the business inputs to calculating risk. We've talked about the technology inputs. One of the things that makes cybersecurity unique is that there is this threat vector. There's an attacker out there. How does that component of cybersecurity and risk, how does that fit into the risk calculation or the process of calculating risk? So it's a factor. It's obviously an important factor. So the threats, the external actors are are obviously important. Internal actors, vectors, all those different facets are important to to any modeling that's being done in any, any kind of situation. So they play various roles, obviously. So you have internal actors, external actors, you have different vectors of, of penetrating an organization. Those all play an important role in modeling the overall risk. And so the joke I, I make is you might have two ways into an organization, and one has eight locks you know, on the front door that prevent anybody from doing anything, any external attacker from doing anything, but then you have the back door with the, that's wide open because you didn't think to cover that vector of attack. And so the threats are obviously important. The volume of threats is important. But how they enter or attack your firm through any number of ways is also important. And you have to cover all those bases to properly defend yourself. That's one of the things that makes it hard, right? <laughs> there are too many ways, too many ways and too many, too many ways to attack you and too many people trying to attack you, yes. Okay, so as you know, Richard, the title of our podcast or the name of our podcast is Cyber Tangent, so we do enjoy going on tangents on occasion. I'm going to drag you on one now and ask you to play the future seer for a moment. If you can imagine a day when CISOs across organizations and throughout industries, are they're all served up a dashboard, let's say, that attaches a dollar impact to observed exposures in their IT environment kind of like the picture you're painting for us. How is that going to change things within an organization, within industries? So I think having that dashboard will look like just other financial risk models and financial risk dashboards. And it will give CISOs, as well as there's a new new title out that's happening called Chief Information Risk Officers. So again, cybersecurity and, and risk are two sides of the same coin. Okay. But for the risk officers, they will have a much more transparency on their environment and on on their risk, where they may see in real time increased threats on a certain vector we just talked about. So you might see increased threats on your firewalls, increased attacks on your firewalls. But you'll also see the controls defending against that threat. Yeah. And you'll have you'll have some way to measure how effective those controls are against that threat, which you don't really have today. That dashboard will give you, maybe not real-time, but near real-time views of your critical assets, if they're being attacked and how, and how strong your defenses are against those attacks. And that will help the chief risk officer and the chief security officer allocate resources and defend against those attacks to protect their assets. That's how I see this all working out, not soon, but down the road. Yeah. How do you think it's going to change the conversations within an organization? You kind of focus on the security team there, but obviously they're... One of their key roles is to communicate to the rest of the C-suite, the board, et cetera. Well, I think tools like Nehemiah are going to have to help with that. So again, when you talk, you know, we speak, we, we in technology speak different languages than those in the business. And that translation is going to be a critical piece where the business understands dollars and cents for the most part. Technology doesn't always talk in that same language. We have to speak the same language. And that is going to be an education on both sides, where technologists and risk professionals learn to talk and convey in dollars and cents. Can't do it perfectly. Models are not perfect. They're models. They need to be refined and fixed over time. But the business has to understand that and be educated on that so they can understand 
their technology risk and get better at managing it. So that's going to be a, a long-term challenge. Last tangent question. Where are we with respect to that vision? Are we just starting out of the starting gate? Are we 50% down the road? And how long do you think before these dashboards are standard? I think 20 to 30% down the road. When I first discovered Nehemiah Security and recently, I was shocked that you all were out there doing your thing. And so I didn't think we were even this far down the road until I discovered you. And so knowing that you're out there and that there's a market, a growing market for these kind of services, I think shows there's been a lot of progress made and that people are asking the right questions to solve this problem. So I think we're still 25% down the path, but that's a lot further than I thought last year. So this is all, all in the right direction. Moving at the speed of cyber. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's a hard problem to solve, but yeah. it looks like people are trying to solve it. There's a great Chinese proverb that keeps us going anyways. It says, if you're looking for shade, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. <laughs> there's no reason not to get started just because it's hard and there's a lot of big obstacles. So we keep plugging. Okay. Popping out, exactly of our, right. yes. popping out of our tangent, Richard, you, you've alluded to the working groups that you are leading. And I know that as part of this, you're developing a series of white papers on technology risk management. I'd like to hear about the process you're going through, who you're involving in those projects, and what we can anticipate as far as questions answered coming out of it. Excellent. So thank you. So yes, I've obviously been thinking about this space for quite a long time. And I've collected a few people who are also interested in this, and those and their disciplines vary quite a bit. I obviously work in the technology space and the technology risk space. We have others involved from financial risks, a former chief risk officer. We also have people involved who do systemic risk, mm -hmm. so looking at larger interconnected industries and the risks that impact those industries. And we have some academics involved as well. And we're all trying to bring our expertise together to try, and it's a challenge, but to try to solve some of these, answer some of these questions about how do we get better at managing technology risk. And so what we plan on doing is we published some white papers. One of those white papers was just a basic discussion around what is the definition of technology risk? Because when you say technology risk, some people think you mean IT compliance. Some people think you mean IT audit. And we try to define all the different functions, IT audit, information security, IT compliance, and risk that we're discussing the same topic. But once we discuss or clarify what IT risk is, we then want to go down deeper into how do you actually measure it. And so we are writing white papers at a high level. What are the factors to assess the inherent value of your IT assets? And the example I gave earlier is still, is still true. Payroll and treasury are both dollar, they both involve quite a bit of dollars but their inherent value differs greatly. And so if you look at payroll as a service, if you have an outage of payroll, that's a problem. You obviously want your employees to get paid. It is not a, an existential problem to the firm. You'll pay your employees and they'll go to work. But looking at treasury and an outage, depending on the time of day, the time of year, an outage of your treasury system might in fact be an existential issue for your firm. And so those are just two simple examples of how do we begin to assess the inherent value of our technology. And that takes a lot of work and a lot of thought. So we are meeting to try and figure that out. How do you assess the inherent value of your, of your core services from a technology perspective? The other, other thing we're working on is control effectiveness. Okay. How effective is a certain control as a, as a measurable quantified number? And so the example we give also is regarding, let's say, passwords and those multi-factor authentication tokens. And so passwords have a certain value. They're, they work, they're easy to use, but they can be you know, hacked, they can be guessed, and those tokens are much, much harder. But how much harder? And how much benefit do you get from those tokens above and beyond passwords in a measurable sense? So we're looking to, over time, apply some brain power to these questions, come up with some well-thought-out methodologies, and hopefully some real numbers, you know, that'll be peer-reviewed and given some thought and published for, for comment to say, we believe, based on our experience and our, and our analysis, these are viable control effectiveness numbers for certain controls that can be applied in these GRC platforms. So we think that would be, a, we think it's fascinating to do for one. It's an intellectual exercise, and we think it's an important part of 
the industry moving ahead. Oh, and by the way, once you get that answer, we'll put it right into our software platform. I thought you said you're going to start with some of the simple problems. Those aren't the simple problems, but I applaud your efforts. They're actually quite no, they're not simple. It's and the de- debates we have are you know not heated, but just you know a lot of good discussion around these things because they are hard. But the joke we make is in the accounting world, everyone knows what, de- what depreciation is. Depreciation is a well-known term to allocate the cost of your capital assets over time. I'm sure it wasn't easy to figure out or reach a consensus on, but we all agree. What we all know what it is today. We all agree to it, and it's a managed thing. It's a managed cost allocation. Right. It might be reviewed on a periodic basis, but we're trying to do something similar in the technology risk space to find some of these common terms that we can all use and rely on versus everyone doing their own unique thing. That's great. We are. We would be a customer of that for sure. Wonderful. Okay, Richard. As we as we wrap up here. Here's my final question. When we refresh this conversation, let me say in three years from now, what will we point to as the top two or three biggest changes or biggest developments that will be made over those ne- over the next two or three years in measuring cyber risk? I think the biggest change will be having the right platforms to do this. And so, again, as we discussed, this is not an easy problem to solve. And the tools we have today, at least historically, haven't been focused on the problems we're trying to solve. And I think tools like Nehemiah and other tools that are out there are going to be critical to doing this because obviously there's a lot of data points, a lot of factors involved, and having the right tools to assess those factors will be critical. And then I also think, unfortunately, we'll have more data points. There will be more outages. I mean, so in the past, the biggest thing we've seen is data breaches. And that's why we have data breach laws and We have got some strong sense of the cost of a data breach, but that is only one type of of technology issue. You can have service outages where things just don't work. We've had a few of those the past few years. I mean, Delta Airlines, United Airlines, we've had day-long outages where this cost, the outage cost millions of dollars of lost revenue. And we will also have integrity issues where systems don't just go down, they go wrong. And so, unfortunately, there are examples of that, too, where one example is called Knight Capital, which was an execution firm that had a trading error in their code. And within an hour and a half, they lost $400 million, and they were gone within a week. So I, that's a one-time event. happened about seven years ago. It hasn't happened since. But I think we'll have, in the next two or three years, more and more broader technology issues with real dollar impact that unfortunately forced us to to get better at this. Well, for that reason and a number of the others that have been mentioned here, the efforts that you guys are on with your working group are the train has left the station, and I don't think it's going to be slowing down anytime soon. So we are amongst your biggest cheerleaders, Richard. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I thank you for being here today on our episode of Cyber Tangent, and I look forward to staying in touch and keeping connected. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Thank you.